a beautiful day here in Florida, and I am recording after a great workout at the gym. And for today, we have someone whose courage is going to inspire you through the microphone today. Ghislaine Maxwell trial is something you may have heard a lot over the news the last year or two, but where did you consume this information? Was it accurate? For this week's episode and season premiere, I have the absolute honor of interviewing a survivor. In her lifetime, Molly Sky Brown has survived abandonment, abduction, rape, sexual violence and manipulation, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, food and substance addiction, body dysphoria, suicide attempts, a divorce. She's been through so much and she's still standing. And today we're going to hear her side of her story. She brings her exquisite personal light humor to every dark shadow from her past enlightening her audience that humor can greatly transcend even the darkest and most shameful of secrets. And I love that her work has not only shifted her own debilitating PTSD symptoms and repeated, repeated, excuse me, suicide attempts, but has helped hundreds of silent survivors. She divinely encounters and coaches. And with today, she is going to inspire so many more before we dive into the show, Molly, I'd like to start with a question. What does mental health mean to you? Yeah. So mental, mental health means accountability. It means acknowledging we have emotions and that we have a spectrum of emotions for a very good reason, whether you're religious or, or believe in God or creation, we were given these emotions for a reason. So let's not bypass them or skip over certain uh, unpleasant emotions. That was a big part of my upbringing is I was never allowed to be angry. And as you've read, there's a lot to be angry about. And if you're bottling that up, then you're masking, you're becoming a different person. You're not yourself. You can't express yourself. So I got into singing and acting to try to cover over that and be able to express and emote through theatrics since I wasn't allowed to in my own reality. So mental health to me means acknowledgement and accepting that we have a spectrum of emotions that we're meant to go through. And there's reasons that we go through them. I love that. We're going to have the good times and we're going to have the bad times, just recognizing that they're both going to occur. And like you said, too, I love that talking to someone, talking about your emotions. We don't want to mask our emotions because it does not do us any good. We've all experienced it, or I should say at least many of us have experienced doing that. And we know the benefits of just letting it out. So thank you for starting the show, Molly. And to everyone listening on, welcome back to a mental health break. It is time once again to talk all things mental health. My name is Vincent A. Lancey. I am your host and author of the books Mental Health Week and Mr. Lancey Talks Mental Health. You can check them out on my website, vincentalancey.com or right on Amazon. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time, on each episode, I sit down with a mental health professional or advocate from all around the world to share their story relating to mental health. You never know whose story is going to resonate with you most. My why for mental health came after suffering a traumatic brain injury, and you will learn today's guest's why in just a moment. I previewed a little bit, but there is so much more than just that preview. Before we get rolling on today's episode, I would love to share that this episode is brought to you by Tampa Counseling and Wellness, our official partners. They're dedicated to helping individuals looking to positively transform their lives through compassionate counseling and wellness coaching. If you struggle with depression, anxiety, or other mental health challenges, give them a call today for a free consultation. They offer virtual and in-person visits, therapy that inspires change, and you can scroll down in the episode description to find their information. Molly was born in the affluent and visually stunning peninsula of Monterey, California in 1978. From the ages of six to nine, she was living in the prestigious and gated community of the coveted Pebble Beach neighborhood, where she began being stalked, brazenly molested, and finally brutally raped by a neighborhood friend's father that lived just three houses away. Divine intervention occurred when her family moved across country to South Florida just a few weeks after the final attack. This is just a preview to today's show and the courage Molly is sharing by joining us. So Molly Sky Brown, thank you so much for joining a mental health break. Thank you so much for having me here. I really, truly appreciate it. Um, I have a lot of predators, so there's, there's so many. Uh, and then moving 
Florida, I got into another ring and then I ended up at an Epstein Maxwell Trump party in 2001. So, I mean, it just like never ended. I feel like God put me in a lot of situations, um, protected me as best he was able to. And I mean, I was mad at God for many, many years. I was like, no, 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 I'm good. <laughs> Your help doesn't seem to help. <laughs> so, um, the, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot that's happening there. And then I also used to sleep over at my first grade teacher's house in, in Monterey as well. So I feel like I was in another ring there. And I've done some research that Monterey in the Bay Area, San Francisco, obviously, is a huge hub of trafficking, pedophilia, satanic abuse, occult practices. And then obviously Palm Beach is another hub, as we well know. So I feel like I just keep bouncing around. And then on top of it, my dad's side of the family is Hollywood occult. My dad escaped it, left it, wanted nothing to do with it and was punished as a result. But I think we were still monitored and tracked. Um, however, I have disabilities. I have congenital hip dysplasia. So I think I kind of flew under the radar as far as how much they wanted to keep a track on me because I didn't have the potential of a lot of the sinister stuff they're planning because of my disabilities. So there's a gift in that. Um, and also being disabled does not prevent you from being abused. I honestly thought a big part of my disability would prevent me from predators preying on me that A, I wouldn't be good enough for them, which right. is a weird mentality, but that's just it there. Whatever is easiest target is invulnerable is what they're going to go for. Whatever's the easiest thing is what they're going to go for. Again, well, thank you so much for taking the time to share this story here today because you are helping so many people, as we talked about in the intro, silent survivors that you're bringing to light now. And thank you for doing that. Ending up at a Trump Maxwell Epstein party in my notes in 2001, after a lot of things you had already gone through. Let's now talk about the mental health side just a bit more here, Molly. Anxiety, sure. depression, those are the more commonly or spoken about ones in the public. But there are other things that goes on. Can you explain what you personally went through and still so do? So for agoraphobia absolutely is one of my biggest issues. Uh, I am, I, I call myself what independently codependent. I am very codependent on my husband. I don't feel safe most of the time. I don't like to even drive. So it's incredibly debilitating the trauma that was put on me and then the psychological ramifications that I'm kind of trapped in my own body. Um, I don't want to pursue things because I was assaulted pursuing my singing career. Like I wanted to sing to kids and I was still heavily assaulted, which is incredibly scary to me. I used to work at a recording studio in high school and I always stayed away from the really hyper-sexualized versions of the high school stuff and that's that they were trying to push me into and I really wanted to do more of the children singing and and Disney stuff and I still for a lack of better words got nailed repeatedly by horrible gatekeepers that you know you think you're protected being in this child division yes. and I mean I remember being on a Pringles commercial audition with my older brother and the director sending my brother out of the room and the director telling me to take my shirt off because he needed to see what my body looked like for a Pringles commercial and I remember like half of half-heartedly like okay and then I was like you know what I don't know of any Pringles commercials where people are naked and I told him I wasn't oh. interested I know and he was really combative he was like no and, and then they're aggressive too so I got really agoraphobic I just kind of became very avoidant of things that were of a great deal of pleasure to me which was acting and singing and performing and modeling and doing all of those things so avoidance agoraphobia PTSD I wake up with uh, a lot of anxiety in the morning. I have nightmares during the night. So I wake up disoriented. And sometimes I think I'm back in the past where I think I'm going to get in trouble for everything and it's the future. So it's incredibly disorienting. And I think these are things we really don't talk about yes. of layers of disability within the PTSD diagnosis. I appreciate you bringing them to light. And again, the courage just to share everything you are, because not many people come on the show and talk about these specific challenges and one of my go many goals with this show is to help as many people as possible and to touch them so thank you so much for shining light on that and well i think a lot of people are not self-aware let's talk about that, that how they can become to, more self-aware yes. that goes back to what you asked me beforehand on the whole emotions and it, we're not even aware so we're taught not to tune into our emotions that anger and sadness and all these things are negative we don't want to see them they're yucky so then we're yes. cutting off half of our personality to fit into a society that is very uncomfortable with those emotions that we're supposed to be filtering through. Uh, and then that ends up perpetuating the mental illness of we have no um, connection with ourselves, our emotions, our bodies. 
So then we have no self-awareness. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a huge self-awareness, a huge self-awareness. I love and that's a big step. We're taught to really, like you said, at the beginning mask our emotions, or at least when I was growing up and maybe for you, we didn't have mental health education. We had health class. We maybe touched on it briefly, but I have no outstanding memory of learning about mental health. And now yeah. I want to stress as well. And I stress it in Mr. Lancey talks, mental health, mental health week, that it is okay to have feelings and emotions. It is normal. We certainly spoke mm -hmm. about the good and the bad in life. There are going to be both trying to enjoy right. the good right. and manage the bad as best as possible is a constant work in progress, or at least for me, I would like to backtrack now in the beginning of your mental health advocacy stages. When did you mm -hmm. first start sharing your story? When I was little. When I was little, the day I was raped when I was nine, I tried to tell my family. But again, I came home with an ugly face at the dinner table. And that was what was more important was controlling my emotions. And, um, you know, rage and anger gets stuff done. Uh, when you're angry, it's, it's an energy that gets you out of a stuckness of, of being maybe depressed or sad. Being fed up and being angry is an explosive, explosive energy. So you can get stuff done. And that's what would happen with me is it would just combust. And then this rage would come out and then I'd get stuff done, get petitions, start talking, start blasting, start yelling, start screaming. And that, I mean, that's not the best way to do it, but it becomes this combustible thing of, you know, I was silenced when I was nine. I was told to speak up, which was the weirdest thing. My mother would be like, tell us, tell us, tell us. And then she wouldn't give me enough information that I, it was stranger danger, stranger danger, stranger danger, not daddy danger, daddy danger. And I kept meeting daddy predators. So I was thinking, okay, well, they can't be bad guys or they'd be in jail because they can't be daddies and predators or they'd be in jail. Only stranger danger is the only thing coming to my mind. So I advocate not so stranger danger of understanding anyone can be grooming you. Um, and I didn't want to destroy people's lives if I was misunderstanding the situation, but I did not misunderstand what happened the day that that man got me in his room when I was nine and, and I got out of there. Um, and I mean, it was absolutely freaking horrific. I am still in trauma therapy to this yeah. day with EMDR. Right. I don't qualify for the EMDR a lot of times because of the level of flashback that I got, the disassociation rate. So, I mean, it sucks. It, and this is why I'm such a big advocate. Uh, sexual abuse is like the rape and murder of the soul. It, it's such an intense trauma. I mean, any trauma is, is just horrific and we have to process these things. Um, but getting back to what you were saying, all of these emotions play a part. And I tried to speak up at the dinner table and instead I was scolded for not being prim and proper and not being a pretty face and, and for picking fights. And, and we were arguing because my predator gave a gift to my little brother, which is how he lured me into my room the whole, the whole to begin with. So they look to divide the whole family, these predators. And that's exactly what ended up happening is I became the problem child. Molly's reactive. Molly's this Molly's that, and then it was Molly was never able to explain herself. And then even when I went to therapy, I, I remember a therapist saying, there's definitely something going on. And my right. parents were so horrified because nothing was going on in our house, that they were like, nothing is going on and shut it down. And that's the thing. My parents were so concerned that there wasn't a problem. And I was fabricating one right. that they weren't allowing me the space to even communicate and see the issues and the problems. And I've had to just radically accept and forgive that those tools were not there available for them right. at the time. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have all of these tools. You just, why is my daughter acting this way on the internet? And you get all of these, oh, could it be this, this, and this to investigate? So I, you know, I've said it repeatedly. If I had a phone at nine years old with Facebook access, the world would be a different place because I would have told you all a long time ago. And that's, but it is yeah. what it is now. And we're learning and growing. And yeah. I tried to take a lot of notes there to revisit. So you're nine years old, you're trying to speak up, but they weren't hearing you and that's unfortunate no. and you also shed light on one of the more positive sides for any younger person having social media whereas they could shed light on awareness that needs yeah. to be there which is what you're doing right now and on a daily mm -hmm. basis i connected yeah. with molly on instagram realizing she had followed me we had followed each other and then we ended <laughs> up making this show possible because i knew all the value and help she could bring to people listening on but to shift to a more positive note something she could do for every single person listening on right now what are some short or long-term tactics things you do to improve your mental health oh so yeah i was thinking about that um so one of the first things that came to me was don't do anything until it feels good nice. i don't know if people are spiritual or what but 
doing anything with a yucky vibe, you don't want to manifest it on that timeline anyway. I'm all about timelines and empowering myself to be on the best timeline to have the best experience. So if I have to do a task, then it's on a timeline that I'm not interested in because it doesn't feel good. So my thing is all about feeling good. Like I said earlier, I wake up very disoriented, confused, uh, scared, nervous, my, my our systems all aroused and hyper alert. And sometimes I feel really nauseous. So for me to just jump into something, it can feel really yucky. So instead I want to get my energy up. I want to do things for myself. I want to make myself feel good so that any projects I'm doing are on timelines that I actually want to manifest good things on. Like that. So that's anything, that's any chore, that's anything that I have to do. So, and if I'm obligated to get somewhere and do something quickly, then maybe the the process is a little bit faster of, okay, well, I'm going to honor and do some nice things for myself in a shorter period of time because I have to be somewhere. But if you have the whole day off and you've got things you've got to do, micromanage, like I'm my own boss, and sometimes you wake up and you're just overwhelmed, well, then do wonderful things to build that energy up and feel really good. So fill yourself up first and then do things. That's that's my first thing. And okay. then the second thing is be really cool with yourself. I mean, just give yourself a lot of grace. Understand that a lot of things manifest and and wonderful things can happen when we surrender and take a nap mm -hmm. <laughs> so we can also relinquish some control uh which is a big thing for survivors we want to be in control which then can make it unbalanced for how much control we want and then we have a hard time surrendering and receiving right. as victims survivors as well because we don't trust so we need to have some trust with ourselves and our and our creator or the universe whatever you're comfortable with believing there's a higher power that is in it for you they're in it for you. They wrote it with you for you to succeed and win on this journey, this trip, this manifestation, incarnation, whatever it is. But be good to yourself. Rest. Pull yourself up. Connect in love with yourself. And that goes in hand in hand with the first thing I was saying of make yourself feel good first before you get into anything that you're doing. And then be really loving and self-acceptance and full of grace for yourself as well. Those, those love, would be my two things. I love everything you said there. It's something I preach a lot too is rest. I'm more of a grandpa mm -hmm. where I'm in bed and eight, nine o'clock, but I make sure eight hours is my thing. I'm more productive Same. in the morning. So I leverage that. And you also touched on structure in a way being organized that for me, at least decreases my stress, makes me feel Same. more ready to go. I can say would be this way to put it, yeah. just not worried about, am I going to get this to I'm time blocked is something that works for me. I stretch out my day that way. But now what everybody else is going to be eager to hear, what are some things you're doing to raise awareness for your story, the importance of mental health? What are some things we're working on? Yeah, so um, I, you know, my, my whole life is really interesting of all of the things that were able to teach me skills that are super beneficial now. Like I know production. I did the morning news in high school every single morning as an anchor and, and then some, some of the production stuff. And then I also ran a recording studio in high school. So I know all of this production, which is super cool. So now when I'm like, okay, I want to talk and no one's hearing me, I can produce myself. I made my own podcast. I wrote a blog. I'm self-publishing my own book. I mean, there's endless opportunity to be seen and heard now. I feel right. like my throat chakra is, <laughs> is ah, just gloriously humming along now, finally. And it's super yes. healed. And the meek are speaking and we're meant to speak. I mean, gosh, it's so easy to speak now. So a lot of it is, is, is coming to terms with the fear of, I mean, my, my family, I, I was preyed on by a lot of predators that were millionaires and billionaires. And, and their thought process was, you lived, let's let it go. Uh, if we speak up about it, they could come get us and we can't fight them. And I, I just, I used to live by that mentality and respect that for my family, but it wasn't respectful of me and my own story. So I had to just start speaking up and be fearless. And again, I'm not religious, but I do talk to a dead ghost that's still around here named Jesus. Uh, but the Bible says 365 times, have no fear. So that's every single day it's telling you to have no fear. And that's what I had to reconcile was, does God want me to be quiet? Or does God want me to speak up and help set all these people free? I remember as a child being really mad at God. I'd be like, who are the meek? Who are the meek? The meek inherit, who are the meek? And I'd hear back, you are. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> but now I see it and the meek are speaking. We have so many platforms. We can speak up so easily. We can, and, and it's hard to speak also. because I know I can be like, here's my little post. Twitter, I got 160 characters. I'm like, what am I going to write? Instagram, what am I going to post? You know, sometimes it's so overwhelming. I don't even know where to get my ideas and, and how to even get my point across for a lifetime of really interesting, abusive situations that I kept manifesting. 
So I appreciate when I come on the podcast like this, that I can focus on little tidbits and how someone else can kind of repurpose some of my material and see some of the things I'm not seeing. Right. And then the overwhelm is taken off me a little bit, but there's a big community behind us. I like the overwhelming message there. Be fearless in anything you're doing. You don't know if you can do it until you try and stepping outside your comfort zone. It. Right. Like one of my rapists is suing me and that was my biggest fear. And yet I'm walking through it and winning every step of the way. So we're here to transcend things and flip some tables. I think you're doing a great job at that. And I'm honored to have you on the show. I look forward to continue following your journey, eventually bring you back on the show, of course. And as you know, a preview for writing with authors. She mentioned that book. Stay tuned for that. And I think it's a perfect time now to get into this week's spotlight story. If it's your first episode with us today, Towards the end of the show, each week, my guests and I go over the mental health of another organization or another individual to let you know that you are not alone. It does not matter how much money someone has or how they look on from the outside. The inside may be the opposite. And today we're going to go over the story of Kanye West, a name in the news right now, no matter where you look. And for me, I started hearing the name Kanye West as a kid with music, and now he's obviously Mm -hmm. doing a lot more battles with mental health challenges and we're going to dive into two articles i found just now Mm -hmm. if you're on the news right now you see him having beefs and arguments with his mother of his children which is terrible to watch right now where the kids are going through this divorce and even on social media there's issues on tiktok with the child posting kanye having rants about pete davidson who is the the new man apparently but i want to share some quotes here i found in the article I'm working on my communication. I can benefit from a team of creative professionals, organizers, mobilizers, and community leaders. Thank you for everyone who's supporting me. I know sharing screenshots was jarring and came up as harassing Kim. I take accountability. I'm still learning in real time. I don't have all the answers to be a good leader and a good listener. These are things he's making public. And I mentioned before for the kids where I can't imagine myself being a kid and seeing my dad on social media dealing with all this, but I do hope he gets the help he deserves. Um, you know, both sure. parents on social media. I it's, mean, I, yeah, we could talk to, about both of them right now. I mean, for me, we can also even talk about the mental health of the children, how they're affected mm-hmm. from this. What's your takeaway on Kanye West or even Kim in the public light? Well, you know, at the core of all of this, which I find so sad is everyone just wants love. Yes. Everyone just wants love and they want this ideal situation in marriage. But then there's all of this really weird programming that our society has around a lot of things that gets into that pure essence of that dynamic of we just want yes. love. And then we're afraid to be vulnerable. And then on top of it, I mean, Kim is this, the most beautiful woman on the planet. And then Kanye is this most genius man thing. So there, then these, these hierarchy dynamics of these impossibles that are not the core of who these people truly, truly are, but they're these manufactured pieces of society that they also have to integrate and be vulnerable. So what I love about Kanye is that he does take accountability. He's like, yeah, 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 no, I see it, I see it. So I love that. I love that we're all learning and growing together because like you said, in the eighties and even the nineties, we didn't talk about any of this. And even his bipolar diagnosis, I wonder if that is still trauma related and not just an organic bipolar diagnosis if there is an underlying PTSD because again then the meds and all the treatments for those things don't really work for bipolar because you're not truly bipolar you're not truly those things you are traumatized and that was why that was my case when I went in uh in 2001 right before I got trafficked to that Epstein party where I met my recruiter at this hospital in Palm Beach that's what they were telling me they were saying you have clusters of BPD you have clusters of um bipolar disorder one, uh, other things too. They, they said no schizophrenia, even though I talked to a spiritual team. So that was good. Uh, they said, no, that that's real. That, that can be, that can be a different thing. (laughs) So that's good. But they were saying all the medications that they were going to be prescribing for those clusters of agoraphobia, anxiety, mood disorder, uh, uh, the sad, the major depressive disorder. None of those meds really honestly helped me. They helped me forget about my trauma enough to move on. But honestly, I don't know that that was beneficial because my whole goal was to get help reporting accountability and justice. And instead I was medicated and kind of pushed on my way. So that facility in itself, I not thrilled with their process. And also the fact that there was a recruiter there and it's in that pedophile ring. I think it's a hospital within their network. So yikes. 
But the fact that Kanye owns up to some of the things and has this discussion, and I love that Pete Davidson is too. These are two grown men. Men don't talk about this. I mean, they're told not to. They're told not to have any emotions that are sensitive. And addressing mental health is absolutely vulnerable and addressing and, and, and accountability and owning what's going on with yourself and trying to address and fix it. But I think at the end of the day, we have a lot of diagnoses that are, are not addressing that they're trauma based. So they're not getting to the root or solution. They're, they're just getting medicated, which again, these medications don't always work for PTSD. Right. Incredible analysis. And I like the real, your highlight there was the accountability and that goes with everything. And to me, you stand out when you hold yourself accountable, because I think we live in this era of people speaking with that intention and talking to talk as someone who's Mm -hmm. been on his entrepreneurial journey now eight years, there's been so many conversations that would have been things to happen that could have really changed everything for me. So even when it comes to mental health, taking accountability can only lead to improvement. If you don't fix something, it's going to stay broken. Thank you for sharing that. And the whole episode, the courage you have for sharing your story. I want to thank you for being you. Thank you for everything you're doing and continue (laughs) doing. As you heard from her, the books on the way, she offered the tips, things that work for her. And I think that can help a lot of people on here as well. I'd like to now stop you and ask, where can we find you? Everything you're up to, website, social media, where can people say hello? Sure, I'll send you some links. If you Google Molly Sky Brown, I think my Kajabi comes up, which is my main website. I use Kajabi. I have some uh, things on there of overcoming trauma, feeling safe with intimacy is a course that I teach on. Because I am married. I was frigid for many years in my marriage due to my abuse. I had massive trust issues. I had all these scenarios going on in my head when moments were trying to manifest. And then those moments pass and there's all this anger and resentment. So there was so much going on. So I work with survivors of sexual abuse, child sexual abuse, any kinds of sexual abuse that's keeping them from having an intimate relationship with an, with someone that they, is trustworthy and worthy of that. My husband is. Uh, I also teach singing him, and yes. vocal lessons. So I, I encourage people to speak up. So I, I do a lot of throat chakra work, which like is speaking that. up, singing work, and then also singing therapy. So throat chakra therapy. Uh, I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and Facebook on Molly Sky Brown. Uh, Survivor Sing on Twitter. I've been banned a couple of times. They don't like yelling at pedophiles and rapists for some reason. I'm like, hey, I have a court order that I'm allowed to. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Everyone, be sure to check out all of her content. Follow her journey. Be sure to say hello. She's a great person to know. And we are at a mental health break on all social media. I am at Vincent A. Lancey on my social medias, as well as YouTube is Vincent A. Lancey. And my website is VincentALancey.com. I wish you all a beautiful day, just like it is here in Florida today. And if you're looking to level up your mental health from a book, please do check out Mr. Lancey Talks Mental Health and Mental Health Week. They're for all ages, ready to go for you on Amazon. We will see you next Tuesday for the second episode of the season. Molly, thank you again for stopping by. Thank you.